Thank you. So, hi everybody, my name is Claudio Canella. I'm from Graz University of Technology, and I'm here to present our paper, A Systematic Evaluation of Trends in Execution Attacks and Defenses. I want to start the presentation with a little bit of motivation, what we wanted to achieve in this paper. So, in the whole field of trends and execution attacks, we have this very confusing naming scheme with variant one, variant two, foreshadow, and uh, at one point it becomes very confusing. So, we wanted to pre present a new one, new classification that makes more sense. We also wanted to do a systematic analysis to show that there are still new variants out there, and if we do take a, look, a closer look at it, we can actually find new ones. There are also a lot of defenses, they cost performance, and we wanted to show how much performance do they cost and whether they actually work or not. And we also wanted to do like a private, uh, prevalence analysis in the Linux kernel, so how many Spectre gadgets actually are there in the Linux kernel. So let's start with Meltdown. What is Meltdown? Well, Meltdown uses data in the out-of-order execution before the permission check is, is actually done. So with that, we can read any kernel address, and th this is easy because the physical memory is usually mapped in the kernel. So th this gives us the ability to read arbitrary memory. Uh, memory. And afterwards, we were able to fix it with in software, KPTI. Newer CPUs already have the, the fix in the hardware, so we don't need KPTI for that anymore. And afterwards, it seemed like the problem is solved. Um, simply because there's no attack surface left anymore. And this is what everyone thought. But as it turns out, Meltdown is a whole category of vulnerabilities. It's not just the, the single instance. Uh, it's not only a use accessible check that fails. If we take a look at the, at the page table entry, we can see here we have many different um, uh, bits in the page table entry. We have the user supervisor bit, which was shown in the original Meltdown paper. Uh, the present bit was shown in foreshadow that this is, causes some problems, but we thought, okay, what happens if we trigger, if we use some of the other bits? And with the user supervisor bit or the present bit, if you cause an exception with those, you get a page fault. So in the first step, we thought, okay, what else causes the page fault? As I mentioned, Melton US, and here we can see the first instance of our new naming scheme. Instead of calling it something like in the original, it was called uh, Spectre Variant Free or Side Channel Vulnerability Free. We just call it Meltdown and use the bit that actually causes us to get there as a naming scheme. And with that, we were able to show with Meltdown, we can leak data from the L1, from the L3, from the line fill buffer. Foreshadow is now Meltdown P, as it is the present bit. Meltdown RW was um, originally called Spectre 1.2 but it's actually a Melton variant. And here we come to the first new one that we found during our systematic analysis. So Melton BK, it uses uh, Intel's me memory prote uh, protection keys, which we, they exhibit the same problem. The permission check is done too late. We get the data and can recover it. And there are also, so with all those, we were able to show that they work, but there are also some that we simply failed in showing any Melton type effects afterwards. So like Melton XD with uh, non-executable or Melton SM with uh, SMAP. And we saw no trends in execution following those. But then we thought, okay, what is actually the root cause behind Melton? And if we look at something like this, we have an instruction and our instruction tries to read data. And a subsequent instruction has um, a data dependency on the previous instruction. Normally, we cause an exception in our current instruction and would expect we just throw away the value because we're not allowed to read it. But as it turns out with Meltdown, the data is forwarded to a subsequent instruction and uh, with that instruction can do whatever it wants until the in previous instru instruction is retired. Only at this point is the uh, is the exception actually raised, even though the CPU knows beforehand that I'm not supposed to do anything with that data. So we looked at some, we continued looking, we thought, okay, the transient cause is that we get a fault. So every time we see a fault, we ex uh, enter transient execution, um, we have a meltdown type attack. And then we get a lot of different variants. 
the ones in red, they, we were able to show those. We have already seen the ones caused by a page fault. Meltdown NM is lazy FB, where you just get data from the uh, floating point unit. Um, Meltdown GB was uh, Meltdown variant 3.a previously, so rogue system register read. And then with Meltdown BR, we get the next instance where we discovered, okay, those were previously not known. Meltdown MPX simply uses the uh, Intel MPX extension. And with Meltdown P BND, it's, uh, it's bound, uh, the bound instruction on old 30 bit 2 systems. Um, uh, and with the bound instruction, we were actually able to show that even though everybody claimed AMD is not affected by Meltdown effects, they were actually affected on, the, on certain CPUs with the bound instruction. So this is the first Melton style variant on an AMD system. And all the others like Melton AC is alignment check, divide by zero, uh, stack segmentation fault. We saw no uh, transient execution following those, in, uh, those faults, but maybe our proof of concepts simply failed to show those. So I would encourage everybody to look into those as well. And um, with that, we have discussed our, this, uh, what we have done with Meltdown. But as it turns out, Meltdown is not the only instance of transient execution attack because there's also Spectre. And with Spectre, we don't exploit faults, but instead uh, data or control flow predictions. So we have our root cause here. We have an instruction that tries to predict based on what the CPU has learned in the past I have done the last five times I've been at this branch. I went in that direction. Now I'm predicted I'm doing the same thing again. So we predict the control flow or a, even data flow. And the subsequent instructions then start executing like they normally would. But the, at one point, the CPU realizes, OK, my prediction is wrong, and flushes the pipeline. and does not uh, delete everything like the microarchitectural state changes in the cache or DLB. It doesn't revert those. So the modern CPUs have many of those predictors. Uh, there is the branch taken, not taken. This is usually done via the pattern history table uh, and for a simple naming convention because this was originally Spectre v1. We call the new variant Spectre PhD. So always Spectre dash and then the, the microarchitectural element that we mistrain. We have the call jump destination. This is the branch target buffer. Uh, function return destination is the return stack buffer. And then with SDL, we check or we try to predict whether a load matches a previous store. And what we also saw is that some of those are even shared among processes. And we thought, OK, what can we do with that if they are shared? In the, in the original uh, Spectre, they mistrained the actual branch in the victim that they later on wanted to exploit. But as it turns out, the, the pattern history table in, in the Spectre PhD attack, for instance, is indexed by either a subset of bits or a hash of some, uh, of some bits of the address. And we can find a congruent address that, ma that maps to the same entry and can mistrain in the same address space, but at a different virtual address. But then it turns out that those predictors are even shared sometimes across uh, hyperthreads or even just between processes on the same hy hyperthread. So we thought, OK, maybe we can do something with that as well. And as it turns out, we can do exactly the same thing, just in a different address space. So in the cross address space scenario, in the in-place variant, an attacker simply mirrors the, the address space of the victim and mistrains the location, lets the victim run, and it encodes some value in the cache. And we can do the same thing in the out-of-place scenario, um, similar to the same address space uh, case. And with that, we get many different variants. So in Meltdown, we have seen that the transient cause for us to get in the transient execution domain is default. For Spectre, it is the, the prediction. And then in our second level of, the, of our tree, we have all the different variants. So Spectre PhD, BTB, RSB. Then we also have the cross address space and same address space scenario. And this gives us a whole, different, a whole lot of different variants of Spectre. 
And all of those that are in red, so pretty much all of, all of them, we were able to show in proof of concept implementations that they work. Now, we have many different variants, but how, how do we fix those? Well, it turns out Spectre is not a bug like it was for Meltdown. So it's a lot harder to, to mitigate those because it is a useful optimization. A lot of our performance of modern CPUs depends on that optimization. So fixing it is not as simple as with Meltdown, and we need workarounds for critical code parts. So in the next step, we then looked at different mitigations that have been proposed over the past, uh, past year. And we saw, OK, there is a, there's a common theme. Uh, there's a pattern with those mitigations. And we can categorize those in three different categories. And the first one, we simply try to mitigate or reduce the accuracy of our covert channel. Because if the accuracy is low, it's a lot harder for an attacker to retrieve the data. In the second one, we can mitigate or abort the speculation if we detect that something is going on. But this is more or less a reactionary defense. And in the third one, we can simply ensure that the secret data cannot be reached. This is similar for, for Meltdown, for instance, where we, with KPTI, we simply remove the kernel memory and the user space cannot access it anymore. Um, and we, what we also saw in, uh, in this analysis is that there are some, some misconceptions about Spectrum, namely that so many of the countermeasures only consider the cache to get the data. But there are other possibilities. And in the past year, we have seen with port contention side channel using, uh, for instance, in Smarter Spectre or the AVX side channel in, uh, in NetSpectre. So it turns out that the cache it is simply the easiest ones. And yeah, we try to use the easiest ones possible. And uh, when we looked at all those defenses. Uh, here we can see on the left, we have the microarchitectural elements. Uh, on the top, all the different defenses that we looked at, and also our categories. So which category do they belong to? And then we can see that some of them, they consider the cache, other the PTB, the RSB, but some theoretically work on those as well. So in the papers already note, we could use the same technique, for instance, for the TLB. And all the others, they don't consider. So I could, it might be possible to just switch to a different microarchitectural element as a covert channel and extract the data. And when you look at that, one thing that you immediately think about is, what happens if I just do that? Am I able? Do these defenses actually work? And that's what we then did. We looked at it on Intel, ARM, and AMD. Um, we were then able to show that for some of those, they actually worked in our experiments. Some partially worked, but not fully. Some did not work. Um, for some, we can theoretically argue why they should work, but we can only theoretically do it because they either require um, hardware modifications or we simply don't have, have it available. Uh, some theoretically impede the attack, and some theoretically, we can argue that they do not work in that, like that. And others are simply out of scope, so they, they don't try to prevent this attack. And with that, we have now many different defenses. We see here that not all of them work, so we need some combination to protect our systems of them. So a combination of those to protect our systems. And for that, we then looked at performance. Um, how much performance do they cost? Because if they are ineffective and they cost a lot of performance, then why should I use it at all? In the top part of the table, you can see um, uh, those that we saw on uh, or perform performance impacts that were shown on real world uh, systems. And um, yeah, we can use in the top, those are based on some benchmarks. Uh, for instance, if we look at serialization, we can see a 60 po uh, 62 to 75% decrease in performance. And serialization is one defense where you have to actually, you as a developer have to add the serializing instruction. And for instance, the kernel would have to do something like that. So we thought, OK, let's do a prevalence study of the Linux kernel. We have four different gadgets that we identified. We looked at the Linux kernel 5.0 uh, in locations where the kernel developers actually already implemented defenses to see are they needed, how many of those are there. And the prefetch gadget is, it is, for instance, interesting for zombie load. The compare gadget is 
you could use like port contention to extract information. The index gadget is the one that was originally shown in the, in the Spectre paper. And here's the interesting thing is, we saw no occurrence of such a gadget in the Linux kernel on the, in the locations that we looked at. And the execute gadget is a very interesting one because it, they load some function pointer and then execute it. And that might give me arbitrary code execution in the kernel. Now, we have proof of concept for all of our, uh, for everything. I just yesterday or something pushed all of our proof of concept to the GitHub page and also the, the tree is available on the, on the website. We're very much open for pull requests, so if you have something new, you can add it there. And um, now, before I finish, I just want to give us a short recap of, of what we did. So we introduced a new naming scheme, and we have already seen in recent publications that people started to adopt this naming scheme, and also some people in the industry. Uh, we were able to show that there are new attack variants simply by doing a systematic analysis. Uh, we were also able to show that defenses cost too much performance for little effect. And for me personally, that's not the kind of defenses that I like. And we also were able to show uh, the prevalence of gadgets in the Linux kernel. Then I would like to conclude with the following. Uh, trends and execution attacks, they are a novel class of attacks. And they are extremely powerful. And I believe that we are only at the beginning of that. And we also have to change our mindset because many optimizations that we introduce in our CPUs, they introduce side channels and now we're at the point where they become exploitable and we need a lot more, um, uh, we need to think more about those in the design of our, of our CPUs. Thank you. Um, questions to Claudio? Hi, John Kurzweil. Uh, nice work. Um, one question I have is when you're searching for gadgets um, in the Linux kernel, you're, the study that you did, are you looking for like source level abstract syntax tree construction, so exactly an if statement followed by a particular array indexing operation? Are you doing uh, an analysis where you're looking at more something like LVMIR where you're looking for like a control dependence and then some set of point arithmetic so that? So in, uh, in this case, we didn't look at something like the AST or something. We actually analyzed the, the high level C code because it, that, was, that was the easiest. There are some problems with that approach simply because we don't know how far our speculation window goes and everything, but yeah, in our instance, we only looked at, at the source code level. Yeah, well, so the thing that I'm wondering is that you may have, especially in the, in the Linux kernel, you may have pointer arithmetic, which has the same type of data dependencies, but it's not going to be an array, it's just going to be a, a random pointer. Yes. Um, which means you may be undercounting. Yes. So. Those numbers, they, they aren't the ones that we see, we've seen. And it's also a little bit difficult to do that because in, in the Linux kernel, you have, if you have functions, they are at one point, uh, a function point is assigned, and you don't know where you actually return to. And yeah. so, yeah, I understand what you mean. It, it's uh, pretty difficult. And in, the, in our analysis, because we look, also looked at tools, like the Smash tool that the Linux developers use, and we tried to look at those, and so far there's no, no real solution on how to find Spectre gadgets, and it's kind of difficult. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, with that, uh, we end the session. Uh, let's uh, thank the speakers again.